Now I've just noticed that someone seems to have left a list of questions in your notes on HIV and AIDS. So I think we'll probably better try and answer them. Now the first question is, what is a retrovirus? Well a retrovirus is an RNA based virus as opposed to a DNA based virus. That means that the genetic information to make new viruses is coded in the form of ribonucleic acid, the RNA. And the other characteristic of retroviruses is that they use reverse transcriptase, which brings us quite nicely on to the next question, which is what is a provirus? Because what happens is once the HI virus has stuck onto the outside of a potential cell it's going to infect, the term is adsorbed. Once the HI virus has adsorbed onto a cell it's going to infect, it injects this viral RNA into the cell. Then what the reverse transcriptase does is the reverse transcriptase converts that into DNA in the host's cell. And this DNA in the host cell carries the genetic information to make new copies of the virus. So when the information to make new viruses is in the form of DNA, that is called a provirus. It is something which has the genetic information to make the next generation of viral particles. Next question. Name the receptor the HI virus adsorbs onto. Well, viruses need to infect cells. That's how they reproduce. But a virus can only infect a cell if the virus can first stick onto the cell, if it can first adsorb onto the cell outer membrane. And the virus needs a kind of docking port to latch onto. It can't just latch onto any part of the cell. So on the surface of the cell, the particular cell that the HI virus infects is the T helper lymphocyte. On the surface of the T helper lymphocytes, there is a particular protein receptor structure, and that's called a CD4 receptor. Normally it receives messages from other cells. It's a form of intercellular communication. But the virus can latch onto this CD4 receptor. And once it's adsorbed onto that CD4 receptor, that means the virus is sticking onto the outside of the cell. So the virus is then in a very useful position to be able to inject its viral material into the cell. So the receptor the HI virus sticks onto our, or adsorbs onto on the T helper lymphocyte, on the potential host cell, is the CD4 receptor. And indeed, if you've looked at blood results from patients with HIV, you might see CD4 counts, because the CD4 receptor is used as a proxy measure for the amount of T helper lymphocytes in the blood at any one time. So if the CD4 count is high, that means there's a lot of T helper lymphocytes in the blood, which is good. You're going to get good immune function. If the CD4 count is low, that means there's not many T helper lymphocytes in the blood at that time, and that's bad. You're going to get poor immune function. Next question. What is the normal role of T helper cells? Well, the T helper lymphocytes detect the presence of antigens, that is foreign infectious material such as bacteria or viruses, and the T helper cells then send messages to the B cells, that is the B lymphocytes, and the B lymphocytes are the factories that make the antibodies. The antibodies, remember, are the immunoglobulins, the immune proteins. But the B lymphocyte won't start making antibodies until it gets this message from the T helper cell to stimulate it to do so. So if you like, the T helper cells help the B cells to produce the antibodies. 
So without the T cells stimulating the B cells, the B cells won't make the antibodies, therefore there won't be any antibodies, or there certainly won't be enough antibodies, and it's the antibodies that bring about the immune response. You will get a defective or inadequate immune response as a lack of as a result of the lack of T helper cells. Next question. Why can HIV be sexually transmitted? Well, it is sexually transmitted. And the reason is that if someone has HIV viruses in their blood, then those HIV viruses will be secreted in seminal fluid in men and cervical secretions in women. So anywhere the cervical secretions go, or anywhere the seminal fluid goes, the HIV virus is going to go with it. That's why HIV can be spread by vaginal sex, oral sex, or anal sex, because it is in the seminal fluid and also in the cervical secretions. Now, the HIV virus is found in some other body fluids as well. There's some in urine, uh, some in feces, uh, even some in saliva. But the amounts of virus in those body fluids is much, much less, whereas the concentrations of the virus in seminal fluid and cervical secretions is relatively high. Next question. Why are male homosexuals a high-risk group? Well, the vagina is designed for sexual intercourse, to facilitate menstruation, and to facilitate childbirth. And the wall of the vagina is a stratified epithelium. There are many layers of cells in the wall of the vagina. Whereas in the rectum, the rectum is only a simple epithelium. The lining is only one cell thick. So whereas the vagina can cope with a reasonable amount of normal trauma, because it's got a stratified epithelial lining, the rectum can cope with hardly any trauma at all. The rectum is designed for storing feces and facilitating defecation. It is not designed to be penetrated. This means that any sexual activity involving the rectum is likely to rupture the simple epithelium lining the inside of the rectum. And just under the mucosa is the submucosa, and the submucosa contains the blood vessels. So even relatively mild rectal trauma can result in some bleeding. This means that any seminal fluid which is introduced into the rectum is essentially going to be in direct contact with the blood and infection is going to become highly probable. And actually, this isn't just a risk for male homosexuals. It is also a risk in heterosexual anal sex. So it's exactly the same situation. Sexual activity involving the rectum is likely to result in damage to the mucous membrane. Seminal fluid can come into contact with the blood fairly directly and heterosexual spread is then likely. But because the vagina is designed to cope with normal sexual trauma, the risk of infection with vaginal sex is much less. Right, next question. What is vertical transmission? Well, vertical transmission is transmission down the generations. So vertical transmission is when infection goes from mum to her baby. So it's mother to child transmission. And vertical transmission is the converse of horizontal transmission, which would be transmission from one person to another who are not in a mother-child relationship. Right, one for us. How may nurses be infected by HIV and what are the risks to avoid? Good question. Well, because the amount of virus in the blood is relatively high, anytime there's blood around, there's going to be a theoretical risk of virus transmission in that blood. 
So if a patient has HIV infection and we come into contact with their blood, there's a risk that we can become infected. Now, having said that, blood, even if it's got HIV virus in it, if it comes into contact with intact skin, that should be OK. Now, I'm not recommending it, but infection is not likely to occur if blood gets onto your skin. But if there's any disruption to the integrity of your skin, then the virus can get in through any little cuts or nicks in your fingers. But of course, contact with any body fluid should be rigorously avoided. So we need to wear gloves, pinnies, anything that's going to protect us when there's any possible risk that we're going to come into contact with body fluids. The other risk is that you could stab yourself with a dirty medical instrument such as a scalpel or a dirty needle. Now this might not sound very probable but I've actually been stabbed twice in my career with dirty needles. Once it was my fault, once it was a doctor's fault but that's not really the point. The point is I was stabbed twice with dirty needles and that does carry some risk of HIV transmission if the person that the needle was taken out of is infected with HIV. So that's definitely one to avoid. And another one is if you get blood splashed in your mouth or eyes. Now again, this doesn't sound that probable. But I have had blood splashed in my eyes once or probably twice in my career. So it can happen when there's a lot of blood around, especially if patients are confused and they're like thrashing their hands around. Blood can get splashed around the place. And the other one, of course, is, is in theatre. If an artery is cut, blood can spurt up in the air. Or if a wound is being irrigated and fluid splashes out of the wound that contains blood, then again, that is a risk and one to avoid. So if there's any possibility of that, we need to make sure we're wearing goggles and, uh, and face protection. So obviously, if you're working with more invasive procedures in theatre, or anywhere else invasive procedures are carried out, then the risk is going to be potentially greater and it is one we must always account for to prevent. Well, here's a good question. What is the incubation period for HIV in the UK amongst adults? The incubation period. Well, it's a hard question because it varies quite a lot. After infection, most people get a seroconversion illness at about four to six weeks after infection. They'll feel unwell for a few days and that feeling unwell is associated with the time that the HIV antibodies first appear in their blood. It's the seroconversion time and it's called a seroconversion illness. So that is typically four to six weeks after initial infection. Then there's usually a long period of time where there's no symptoms or minimal symptoms and during this period of time the patient may well not realize that they are infected with the HIV virus and this period of time in the UK typically goes on for about seven to ten years so seven eight nine or ten years with minor or no symptoms but during that time the patient is still infectious. Then after that typically there's something called ARC, AIDS related complex, where the patient starts to suffer from immunodeficiency symptoms and then finally full-blown AIDS, full-blown acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And typically that period will last two to three years without treatment and then the patient will die depending, of course, on what infections they happen to get. They could get an infection which kills them before then. So, answer to that question is a bit complicated. Four to eight weeks for the seroconversion illness, seven to ten years before the onset of AIDS-related complex or full-blown AIDS. So seven to ten years with minor or no symptoms would be the sort of incubation period. And that ties in quite nicely to the next question. What happens during the group two phase of HIV infection? 
So in the group 2 phase, for quite a few years, the patient will have no symptoms or only very minor symptoms. So we could say this is an asymptomatic phase. The patient won't have any symptoms. So what happens during group 2 phase symptoms? Group 2 phase is essentially nothing, but the patient is infectious during that time. They will have viral particles in their blood, in their cervical secretions, or in their seminal fluid. Right, why are HIV patients prone to diarrhea? Well, normally the T cells actually line the wall of the gut. I mean, they're in the blood as well, of course, but you also get them lining the wall of the gastrointestinal tract. And if the number of T cells is reduced, there's going to be less of these immune cells lining the wall of the gut. And the reason that it's important is that the B cells that the T cells stimulate produce immunoglobulin type Gs, which help to protect the lining of the gastrointestinal tract against infection. Without the immunoglobulins, there's less immunological protection in the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. So it's much more likely that any virus or bacteria that enters the GI tract is going to cause infection and inflammation and diarrhea as a response to that inflammation. Next question, what form of fungal meningitis are HIV patients prone to? Well, it is indeed true that in AIDS patients can get fungal meningitis. Now, you've probably come across meningitis before. It can be caused by haemophilus or meningococcal meningitis. Or more commonly, in fact, it's caused by viruses, viral meningitis. But people that don't have HIV are very, very unlikely to get fungal meningitis. So the fungal meningitis is pretty well restricted to patients with HIV, and it's called cryptococcal meningitis. The fungus is called cryptococcus, causing a cryptococcal meningitis. And that needs to be treated with systemic antifungal drugs, fluconazole, for example. Right, name a pneumonia caused by a protozoa HIV patients may suffer from. Well, this is a protozoa that can cause pneumonia. And again, this is very uncommon. Pneumonia is normally caused by bacterial infections, such as the pneumococcus bacteria, which you're probably familiar with. But patients with HIV can get a protozoal pneumonia. And it's pneumonia. It's a life-threatening condition. It causes consolidation in the alveoli. Pneumonia is always a life-threatening condition. And this is called pneumocystis carnii pneumonia. So pneumocystis carnii is the name of the organism. Pneumonia is the name of the infection. So it's PCP, pneumocystis carnii pneumonia, PCP. Right, next question. What is the most important global infection associated with HIV? Well, in terms of numbers of people infected, I'm going to answer tuberculosis to this question. HIV and tuberculosis very often go together. Areas of the world where there's a lot of HIV also tend to be endemic areas for tuberculosis. And someone with HIV will have markedly reduced resistance to tuberculosis so if they come into contact with tuberculosis, they're probably going to contract that disease. If they've got active tuberculosis, they can then pass it on to people who have HIV infection and indeed to people who do not have HIV infection. So it's going to increase the total amount of tuberculosis in the population. And of course, this makes treatment quite difficult. Patients can present with tuberculosis and HIV, and they need long-term treatment for the HIV, and they'll also probably need six months to a year treatment for the tuberculosis as well. So quite a global health challenge, this bad combination of HIV 
and tuberculosis. Now, the next question is on co-infection. Now, co-infection is where you get two infections at the same time. And because the modes of transmission for HIV and hepatitis B and C are similar, it's not that rare that people infected with HIV can have hepatitis B or C as well. Or if someone has already contracted HIV and are immunocompromised, and then they come into contact with hepatitis B or C, the probability of them getting that sort of viral hepatic infection is much increased. In patients who have HIV and co-infection with hepatitis B or C, the viral loads for hepatitis B and C are increased, and the advance towards possible cirrhosis is much accelerated. So someone who's got hepatitis B or C and HIV are likely to get cirrhosis of the liver at a much earlier stage than someone who has hepatitis B or C infection, but in the absence of HIV. So it's another bad combination. Name a type of malignant tumour infected individuals are at risk from. Well, the classic malignancy that people with HIV get is Carposis sarcoma. It's a malignant tumour affecting the skin, Carposis sarcoma. What does the term viral load mean? Well, the viral load is the number of viruses in the blood. So a high viral load means that the, there's a lot of viral infection a low viral load means there's less viral infection. And also this affects infectivity. This affects how infectious the person is. So someone with a high viral load is going to secrete a lot of virus and therefore are going to be very infectious. Whereas someone with a lower viral load is going to secrete less of the virus and therefore be less infectious. Right, next question. Does treating sexually transmitted disease in the general population reduce the spread of HIV? Well, the answer is yes. Because if there's sexually transmitted disease affecting the genital mucosa already, that's likely to reduce the integrity of the genital mucosa. That means if that person is subsequently exposed to the HIV virus, it's like an open door. The virus can just go straight in through the hole in the genital mucosa and cause infection. Whereas the person, if the person didn't have a sexually transmitted disease and their genital mucous membranes were healthy and intact, it is less likely that the virus will be able to gain entry into the systems of the body causing HIV infection. Therefore, in at-risk populations for HIV, we should make vigorous efforts to treat pre-existing sexually transmitted diseases. Right, what is triple therapy? Well, in triple therapy, we give three antiretrovirals together. And there's two reasons for this. One is that it reduces the viral load very quickly and very effectively, so the patient starts feeling a lot better. And the other is, if we just give one antiretroviral at a time, there's a risk that the virus will develop resistance to the therapy. So we normally give at least three antiretroviral drugs at the same time as a triple therapy. What is the prognosis without treatment? Well, without treatment, the patient will usually die two to three years after the onset of an AIDS-related complex. They could die earlier, it just depends on what infection they get, but they're going to be prone to very serious, overwhelming systemic infection, and they will die from that infection. But if we give highly active antiretroviral therapy, that is if we give heart, we can increase the life expectancy of this patient absolutely massively. So everyone with HIV infection should be given highly active antiretroviral therapy combined with good health education so they don't spread the virus onto other people. But with good 
application of antiretroviral therapy, a greatly prolonged life expectancy can be hoped for and indeed expected. For and indeed expected. For and indeed expected. For and indeed 